Coming to you live from downtown Detroit, this is Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep with your host, Joel Elkanen. This is a volatile puppy here, isn't it? And Dennis Dick. I've been a penny. I will buy the stock for a penny. With everything you need to start your trading day. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this Thursday morning edition of Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep. I'm Spencer Israel, as always, joined by Joy Alconin and Dennis Dick on the show today. It's going to be a bit of a retail day. We've got a couple retail stocks reporting Macy's and Kohl's. Uh, also, some other stocks reporting yesterday we'll discuss. Uh, Square, uh, Roku, some big reports tonight as well, NVIDIA and Equifax. So we'll get to as many stocks as we can. We'll, of course, take your questions in our chat as well at premarket.com. Benzinga.com and on our YouTube page. Our guest today will be at 835. That's Lloyd Perlmutter. He is a former retail industry executive. He's now an advisor to the retail industry. Joel, how's it going in the market today? Oh, absolutely horrible, Spencer. I don't know what to do. The spoos are down 11 and a half points, trading GIFs off the lows of the session, down through Monday and Tuesday's lows. Not sure when the circuit breakers are going to kick in. We'll talk about the reasons for the decline with Dennis. Uh, next support point I see is 75.50 basis, the spoos. That was Monday's low coming back on the upside. Man, oh, man, will we ever see 25.86.50? Uh, that's mid-range on the day. Crude hanging in there, up three cents. Uh, went through that double potential double top we were talking about in the 57 handle. 57.92, but turned around on a dime. Now struggling to stay in the 57. So we'll see what happens with that today. Gold and silver going uh, mixed directions here. Gold up three and a half at 1287.20. Still in a trading range. Uh, silver hanging on to the 17 level. Silver's down 4.8 cents at 17.08 and a half. Dennis, are you out there buying a bunch of retail stocks this morning? I don't know about retail stocks, but I just I am buying a few of those stocks. You got to be buying something on the pullback, isn't it? BTFD still, Joel? Isn't that still the trade? Yes. Or did that change? Uh, no one. No, I didn't get the memo yet, and it's. I didn't get the memo. You, I'm still buying dips. You are okay. Yeah, I'm still buying some stuff here. I just bought some Walmart on a dip. Walmart <laughs> just made a new 52 week high. Now it's pulling back 60 cents this morning. I like it. Okay. All right. Uh, well, we um we're gonna we got 10 minutes here. And we're not going to go on tangents because at the 815, Jeff Goldman is going to be coming on. And he is 815. We got 815. Jeff Goldman. Yay. So let's rip Excellent. some of the reports and get some work done here. Okay. Let's go through. Let's go through the retail stocks here right now because we've got a bunch of them this morning. We know they've been obviously in shambles here, but you know it's continuing for Kohl's. Macy's is trying to show a little bit of life here. It's only down two cents, which is like a win for that, I guess. Let's go to the Kohl's report first, though. Macy's still digesting. That just happened five minutes ago there. Kohl's is down almost 10%. I mean, the stock is now, you know, this is the one I like the best of them all, but I don't like any of them. So, I'm not in. I'm not in any of these. I'm glad I'm not in any of these. Spencer, details on the Kohl's report. KSS. Kohl's, the one department store I actually like going to. Q3 just. I like it too. Yeah, seventy cents is a two cent miss. Seventy two cents was the estimate. Sales of four point three three two billion versus a four point three billion dollar estimate, so they slightly beat that. Comps are up 0.1 percent for the quarter. They're also narrowing but raising the lower end of their fiscal year uh, EPS and sales out, or just their EPS outlook. So they're narrowing it, but they're raising the lower end. I don't know what to say. Six <laughs> percent dividend. I can't, you know, I, I do see all the support, tons of support down here in 35, 36 area. That's where we look like we want to go to. Maybe it does get a bounce there. If you put a gun to my head and tell me which department store you have to buy, I would say it's Kohl's, but there's no gun to my head and I'm not buying any of these things. Just because they have just been the worst place to hold money here for about the last two years. I don't know. There's support down there, Joel. Are you playing it for a bounce? <laughs> you know, or you're, 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 Dennis, you're saying it so tepidly. There, there, there's support down there. There's support, but we've seen what <laughs> happens with retailer support. It gets taken out. <laughs> All right. Well, we're trading just off the lows of the pre-market session right now as we speak. That low stands at 36.80. We're only 14 cents off that. So there may be some more work to do on the downside. Uh what Dennis is referring to here is uh, some monthly lows that we had in the stock. 
And that was at 36 and a half. You had one monthly low at 36 and a half, another 36.21. So once again, if I was short and this thing was down, you know, 10%, nearly $4, would I be looking at those monthly lows? Anything you know, under 36.50? Heck yeah, I would. Um, that's where the that's where the support's been. Big a big move. How's the volume, Dennis? I didn't really check the volume. Oh, well, already seven hundred twenty six thousand shares. So this is going to be a huge volume day for Kohl's. Crazy amount of volume. Macy's is lifting right now. Let's jump over to the Macy's report really quick because Macy's actually meandered there around seventeen and a half, popped up, went down back to under seventeen. Now it's up over eighteen bucks. Really bouncing around here. I don't think the report was great, but this is one of those examples of you don't have to do much because you're a retail stock. And if you say anything that's even remotely okay, stock can lift. Spencer, what did Macy's have to say right at the top of the hour? And Macy's, I worked there once upon a time. Q3 adjusted EPS, 23 cents. It's a four cent beat. 19 cents was the estimate. Sales of 5.28 billion versus a 5.31 billion estimate. So a slight miss on the uh, sales comps down 4%. But they are raising their fiscal year adjusted EPS outlook so that's good news that's somewhat good news here i'm not coming and buying any retail stock but i'm not shorting them down here now i mean you know it's been killed 8.44 percent dividend i still think the dividend is not safe i think eventually they're cutting and i think the debt is a major problem here at macy's i didn't know you worked at macy's spencer <laughs> yeah, what you do at macy's once you like I, I was in receiving, so they hid me in the back. And <laughs> they hit you in the back. You weren't yeah, good I enough wasn't, for the I wasn't allowed to talk to customers, no. <laughs> this crazy guy. You keep him away from the customers. Put him in there. He'll fill orders. You, you weren't one of the uh, guys that stood in the aisle and then in the men's section, and then when a man worked by, you tried to like spray that uh, – Cologne on them or whatever. <laughs> no, I almost they hit a guy once. Buy buy cloning. Yeah. Oh, I hated yeah. that. I mean, I would go all the way around the store just to avoid those guys. Like I need that stuff. But anyways, talking Macy's here. Sixteen seventy five pre market. I think that you're the only person that had that happen to me. You must have stunk. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Sixteen seventy five. Your pre market low. I hasten to say we're not going to see that today. I don't. But you never know when things get down and dirty. I'd still be looking at this uh, double bottom. Uh, that would be from Tuesday and Wednesday, 1741, 1742. That was a relevant level the last two days. If it holds, got a chance for a rally. You had two closes right in the same area. On the upside, we did sneak our head over 18, 1820 is your pre market high. To me, I'd let it clear 1840 because your three day high is 1836. So, you're going to have a lot of trade in this area. Spoos are making a new low as we speak here. Down they 13. are trouble. Oh, here. boy. Trouble, trouble. What, 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 what's the reason for the sell-off here? Do we have an actual reason? Because it's not Macy's. It's not Kohl's. What's the actual reason, the reason here that is we got? Because I was thinking last night that there's no way this tax deal is going through, and I want to wake up in the morning and short everything. And now... With the spoos down 13 and a half, you know, I'm going to wait for a rebound that may never happen. That's what I think the reason is. And uh, chat, you guys can uh, weigh in. Jimmy A says Japan. I don't know. I don't think the overseas markets, you know, I, I think it's just worried about what's going to actually happen in Washington. And if it's any example of what's going on so far, nothing. Fuzzy's blaming it on Japan. So uh, we could take a look at that market if we want. I'm blaming it on Barron's. Barons? Yeah, you want to know why? Why? They published an article yesterday that says why Facebook shares are likely to keep rising. <laughs> so, of course, Facebook's going to top out here now. And if you don't get the joke, it's because Facebook, right when the stock was trading at $18 or $20, uh, Barons came out with an article that said Facebook is worth 15 And obviously, Facebook went straight up from that point. So, when Barons gets bullish Facebook, I think Facebook's topping out. And Facebook's topping out. The whole market's topping out, Joel. This is it. This is the top. We just found the top. Oh, we're getting a little bit of a joke. There a little was, bit of a joke. Uh, Japan and uh, Europe are weak. Jimmy A says 900 point swing in the Nikkei. So there you go. Oh. Overseas markets uh, affecting our markets. Way to go, Jimmy A. And uh, okay, let's move on. We got three minutes till we give Jeff a call. 
Yeah, we're going to talk some Bitcoin in three minutes here. Let's just jump over into a couple other reports there from last night. The Square, my day trading stock, the stock I like to trade the most, I tell you, the range was incredible last night. It didn't make a few trades. It chopped around a little bit, though. It was a little bit tricky. Anyway, Square, SQ, range 37.95 high, 34.34 low, settling in here. But holy cow, it's a crazy range, Spencer, details. Uh, the adjusted EPS for Square was seven cents versus a five cent estimate, uh, and the they're also raising their outlook for the fiscal year. Their EPS outlook has been increased by uh, three cents on the low end of the range, and their sales outlook was also increased by a little bit. Stock uh, price was crazy last night. It popped. It dropped. It popped, it <laughs> dropped. You call this the yo-yo chart there from After Hours. You know what the sad thing is here? And I, I had that 38 level pegged. And I had it in my head already, and I said it on the show, that I think this could have a good report and still go down. It popped up, and I'm sitting there at 37.98 into the, you know as it's popping. And I'm thinking, 38, it's not going through 38, so I'm at 37.98 right in front of it. The high goes right up to underneath me at 37.95, and then I watch it fall two bucks. I was like, are you kidding me right now? So anyway, so I did not get short on that initial spike. I did get short a little bit later on, but it would have been nice to get right near the high there. I had it, uh, uh, but I was just three cents off. I don't know. If I was at 37.95, the high would have probably been 37.92. Mm -hmm. They like to trade those things in front of you when they're all chopping up like that. But anyways, SQ, Joel, technical thoughts as we've had this yo-yo pattern after hours. Dennis, you kind of, this is your stock of the day, stock of the year. You've been all I like trading the been, stock. Been, is it going to be? I was even right on this, but. I just didn't get filled. Is it going to be number one uh, at the year-end balance? I don't know. We'll have to look. Okay. Well, it's not the year-end yet, so you could still lose a lot of money in it. Uh, Square, do they accept Bitcoin? Do you know? Can you use your Bitcoin on there? We'll ask no. Jeff that in a minute. All right. Throw out the high. Throw out the low. Thirty-seven ninety-five. That was just above all the all-time high that you had at thirty-seven seventy-five. So there's your major resistance. Uh, throw out the low that was under thirty-five dollars at thirty-four and change. Uh, you might see that today. I'm trying to look at yesterday's low. We're still trading above that thirty-six even, but we're not bouncing. So that's going to be my swing number. If it holds thirty-six, maybe you'll see the close of uh, thirty-six seventy-one. Coming back under thirty-six, I don't see much until thirty-four seventy-five, and man, that is really close to where your pre-market low is. All right. Spoo's just hit 75.75. It's an all-out bloodbath here in the S&Ps this morning. Down 15, but uh, oh, pretty. Let's, uh, let's give Jeff Goldman a call real quick. Uh, author be, um, extraordinary. Be, um, you want to take a break? You want to call him live. Let's call him live. All right. We'll call Jeff Goldman live. Author of uh, Fail traders, the 20 common mistakes committed by over a 1,000 losing traders, but more importantly, he's our resident Bitcoin uh, expert, uh, most importantly, a graduate of Hello. Michigan State University. Hey, Jeff, you're on Benzinga's pre-market prep. How's it going this morning? Good. How you doing? Doing well. I think Joel and Dennis have some pressing Bitcoin questions. I'll start with me oh, because boy. once once Dennis starts, then, you know, the show only I runs, never shut up. It only runs to nine o'clock. So um, <laughs> I don't know when your next appointment is, Jeff. Uh, I just the square except Bitcoin. That, that's my question. What's what's the question? Square. That's, that's a weird question. The square. I don't, I don't think know what so. you're talking about. I think he's trying to make a joke. Uh, I think I think that was a joke. No, it that, wasn't a joke. Oh. I mean, it's a payment <laughs> system, right? That's I don't believe they do. Okay. All right. That was an easy question. All right. Go ahead, Dennis. Okay. okay. So the harder question here, and I'm not sure. I, I know you follow everything pretty, so you probably know about this. This, uh, I, I was just reading in The Guardian there yesterday, and I'm going to talk actually not about Bitcoin, but about Ether. And um, this 300 million uh, Ethereum dollars in Ethereum that got stolen there yesterday um, or over yeah. the last couple of days. Not, not stolen, but lost, apparently. Um, somehow, you know, there was somebody in there trying to do some coding and all of a sudden they locked it out and these 300 million Ethereum are just gone forever. I mean, Correct. this is the one thing that, you know, scares me. And this is one thing that I, and, and I know you're an investor in Bitcoin. This is the one thing that scares me. And I'm hoping you can, you know, calm my fears on it. And this is why I don't invest in cryptocurrencies is the fact that there's no recourse. And what I mean by that is if you have, you know, um, 
ten thousand dollars in your bank account and your bank accidentally loses your money well your bank comes good for that or if your bank goes under you know there's fdic insurance you know there's different insurances that you know there is recourse there's place you know ways to get your money back when this you know is lost though, or stolen or hacked out of your account these bitcoins or ethereum these are just gone there's no insurance or anything on this or is there well this was the equipment this was this was sort of the equivalent. It, this was an outside wallet. So there's different ways to store your Bitcoin or your uh, Ethereum. There's just different ways to store them. You can store them literally on a piece of paper. You can store them just in your head if you have a good enough uh, memory. But there's different ways to store your Ethereum or Bitcoin. So this was a particular wallet. Uh, it, it was a hardware wallet on a computer. And somebody sort of hacked in or change the code so some of these were lost. So a good analogy would be that you were taking your money from the bank and it wasn't in the bank, it was outside the banking system uh, and someone stole your wallet. Now you have okay. no recourse if someone steals your wallet. Uh, but that's a, probably a better analogy than that. It's not like the uh, Ethereum uh, blockchain was compromised in any way. It has been in the past, but uh, it was not like that was what happened here. What happens if the if Ethereum blockchain does get compromised? What happens? I'm just you know trying to understand it all, and obviously you know that's why we bring people like you on to give us a better understanding. Let's just you know even yeah. use Bitcoin. What happens <laughs> if the blockchain does get compromised? What happens if it gets hacked and you know a billion dollars worth of these things, or you know a hundred, or let's just say a million dollars worth of these things? Get stolen, and let's just say you're bad. It's bad luck enough that that was, you know, some of your personal bitcoins that get stolen. What do you do? It's, it's very nothing's impossible, but it's very difficult to hack the system. Well, uh, hasn't it already been hacked? I thought it was hacked. It wasn't a hack. There was a when they changed the code a little, a little bit. Uh, yeah, and Ethereum actually split into two. That's why there's an Ethereum Classic. Uh, you know, I, I'd like to say that that was a little earlier in the in the in the life cycle of it when it yeah. wasn't as mature. I could be totally wrong on that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but it's very difficult, and that's that's exactly why, like right now, with this whole segue two, where they're trying, it was just called off yesterday. They were trying to change the the Bitcoin community was trying to change okay. some of the coding to make it uh, depending on who you listen to a little more efficient by uh, lengthening some of the the factors to make it a little quicker. And it takes 50% of the, uh, the miners to change these, these codes and 51% said they were against it. So that's why it was called off yesterday. So it's very difficult to hack. I'd say almost impossible. The blockchain unless obviously it's maybe just starting out and there's not a lot of people uh, doing checks and balances against it. Do you think that eventually if this gets big enough that there will be some type of insurance, you know, because you look at AIG over there, we know they insured subprime mortgages. Do you think there's an industry here that, you know, somebody like a major insurance company could come in and say, look, we'll insure against hacks. And I think that then all yeah. of a sudden, I think, you know, if that was to happen, I think I would be more comfortable buying something because my biggest fear is just I see these hacks and, you know, they get big media attention and, you know, and maybe, you know, it's, it's you know, being blown out of proportion onto what exactly happens. But when I see a headline from The Guardian that 300 million Ethereum lost forever, I'm like, I don't want to invest in that. So do you think insurance companies maybe are licking their chops at the thought of eventually maybe insurance yeah, against absolutely. these hacks? Absolutely. Maybe we Absolutely. should do that. Maybe we should be the insurers, although I'm not. Yeah. <laughs> and as you're talking about no, but not even buying it. AIGs, if AIG is listening to this, you know they're going to do it over there, especially those guys in Boston. <laughs> I'm sure they're listening. Uh, yeah, but just keep in mind, you, know, you can you can store your – there's so many different ways to store your cryptocurrencies, and some of them are safe and some of them are, uh, are, are less safe, but you can store them literally on a piece of paper, put that paper in a safety deposit box and that's not getting hacked. Yeah, and, and that's this ahead. guy. And I just want to continue on this. Okay. I heard, and I think it was yeah. East maybe talking about this. The chat was talking about this was somebody talking about it in the chat. Somebody had a whole bunch of Bitcoin stored on their hard drive and the hard drive somehow mm -hmm. got thrown out and it's just gone. 
Why is there no like yeah. record of that? Like I like I don't understand. Like the blockchain itself is a record in itself, but if they're just over here on this hard drive and there's no record of it, is there a way to record it so that you know it's not just stored on your own personal computer? That you know it is in the chain, and if your computer gets breaks or whatever, they're not gone. Like is that just you know, or that was just so? So there's there's still, like again, there's different ways to store it. The, if you store it on your hard drive. That's a computer wallet, and he should have. There's a, a backup. Uh, there's it's a, a randomly generated 12-word phrase that you should store somewhere different, just in case your computer crashes. Uh. That you can restore your wallet. The person that that happened to obviously didn't have their 12-word. Uh, as a pass key to to restore, but yeah, you have a pri- there's a public code and, and a private key, a, pri- a public key and a private key, and your private key is your key, and you have to keep that. Otherwise, yeah, your Bitcoin will be lost forever. That's why I was saying that a piece of paper where you can store it on a piece of paper, or like I was saying, if your memory is, is you know if you're smart enough to remember your 12 words, you can completely store your Bitcoin in your head. You don't even have to do it on a uh, even a piece of paper. I don't think anybody does that, but just to show you that uh, different ways of storing it, they all have their pros and their cons. And yeah, that uh, if your computer crashes and you don't have your, your pass key, you're, you're screwed. Well, is it just 12 words or is there numbers in the words and stuff? Like, cause you'd think like a hacker could probably figure out 12 words. Like how exactly? Well, does- it's 12 random words. Considering there's how many words are there in the <laughs> in the alphabet <laughs> in the, in the, well, in the a, English language? There's a lot of the letters in the alphabet. I don't know how many words. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. There's uh, no. It's it's very. It's it's almost impossible to. You know, I, I guess it would be pretty hard to figure out three words. In, According in to order. Oxford Dictionary, there's 171,000 words about. Okay, there you go. And this is 12. Should be able to figure out. Well, I guess you got 12 different combos. Yeah. So you start doing your mm-hmm. finite math on that. The combinations are pretty incredible, I guess. Yes, yes. <laughs> Jeff, um, you are perfectly, before Joel just takes over the show here, <laughs> <laughs> I want to get one more on this. So you are perfectly yeah. comfortable. How do you, can you tell us how you store your Bitcoins? Can you just like tell us, like, are you one of those that keep the words in your head? Or do you have it written down the piece of paper in the safety deposit? How do you, no. how does Jeff Holman protect his Bitcoins? I, or are you not allowed to tell us that? No, I would prefer not to say how I keep it. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> I, I don't we got all the hackers listening to this. <laughs> like, oh, Jeff Goldman's uh, Jeff Bitcoin Goldman, here right now, exactly live on the right. market. Uh, we got a hacker right and that, here. And, okay. that's probably, and that's probably good advice for anybody. Don't tell them how you store your bitcoins. Okay, okay. exactly. Two things. It's one, nice to get into the mechanics of this sometimes. Okay. Yes, I thought you said. I, I mean, that's saying, yeah, that's like saying, yeah, I, I keep my. I keep my money under my mattress and my, you know, upstairs guest bedroom. So that would be an analogy of, of that. So, uh, Dennis, <laughs> you asked those questions because you know my conversation with Jeff, and you know he was explaining to me the process and everything. And I said, you know, Jeff, what if you get hit by a car tomorrow? Okay, like how's Stacy going to get your bitcoins? And he has a process for that for her to do it. So he, you know. Because that was one of the things I was asking about. That's a great uh, Jeff, point just, too, yeah. just one other thing. And uh, Dennis, I don't know if you know about this. How long ago was there like um, like a bad print or a Rug Algo or something? And a lot of people got taken out of their positions because of, you know, some false price movement. And didn't one of the exchanges like restore the Bitcoins to the people that made the, the trades good? Was that a while ago? Do you yeah. remember the incident that I'm talking about? It, yeah, it was a few months ago and uh, on Coinbase or on GDAX, which GDAX is a is owned by Coinbase. And GDAX is, a, I'm looking at it right now, I actually have it on my screen. And it is an exchange that you can uh, buy and sell just uh, with a, a, a level two uh, that you can see all the bids and offers and you can and buy and sell. So they had a flash crash where all the liquidity basically just went away for a second and a bunch of stops got taken out a lot lower and a lot lower. So people, I think it was trading at maybe around 300 at the time. 
and uh, you know trades went off at 10 cents so yeah they made people good on all their cells they restored people it took a while uh it took probably about a month but they got people their ethereum back in their accounts they didn't have to they stepped up and and and, and made all their clients good We've been on the line with Jeff Goldman. He's the author of Failed Traders. He's also my personal trainer. And uh, Jeff, I hope <laughs> I hope to see you later on today. Great input. Dennis was hot on this. We are going to be getting together, get you back on the show. That's it. We can't talk more. This is it. I had all. We can talk more. What else he got? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Joel, Joel's, Joel's okay, quick ahead, on the Dennis. trigger here. He says, "I got to keep the we show talk, moving I here. We I got two minutes price before price imbalances here. come out." I got two I minutes we were for you, Jeff. Talk price targets. What you thought? What I thought? Yeah, of this year, where, you know? we've been blasting off into orbit here in this Bitcoin price. And what is your price target? Are you still holding? I'm still holding. Uh, again, my my price target is still well. I, up until up until about a month ago, I would always tell people when it, this can go to zero or it can go to fifty thousand. And at that point, about a month ago, I was saying. Equal probability, probability, but this is really, really catching on in terms of, and it's not all speculative now. It's you guys look at like what what's going on in Japan in the Bitcoin world to really understand how big this can get. You know, it's it's the Japanese government recognizes it as a legal form of payment. And I was just reading something yesterday which totally blew my mind. But they predict next year there'll be 300,000 retailers in Japan that will accept Bitcoin. So this isn't something anymore that's just highly, highly, it is definitely highly speculative. But it's not just something that it just, you know, the, the greater fool theory that I'll buy it and hopefully I can sell it to somebody else and hopefully this whole thing doesn't fall apart. You know, you got people in Venezuela now that are buying this as a store of value. So there's actually become some real real uses for it and if you keep in mind that there's there's only going to be 21 million bitcoin ever uh mined and there's already 16.8 in existence so that's 80 percent is already out there that and you get the cme and you get uh people and options and need to start grabbing these for hedging purposes you know if supply and demand the demand or the supply side fixed and the, the demand side takes off, this can go a lot higher and pretty quickly. Okay, Jeff. Jeff uh, one more, so one more question I have for you. Yeah. Just coming from, yep. from uh, one of my friends, Jamie over at Bright Trade, and he's just asking, how exactly, you, okay, so you're, you, you've, you've, you've heard the story of the Bitcoin, everybody else, your friends, you know, are all in it, and you know, you want to get into Bitcoin. What is the process for actually, because you can't go to exchange, just buy it on your brokerage account. What is the actual process for going and buying a Bitcoin? Very easy. Uh, not that I recommend Coinbase. It's US based. Uh, it's, it's regulated by, I don't know who it's regulated by, but it is. And you open up an account there. The, the scary part of doing that is you have to do one of two things. You either have to connect, once you open up your Coinbase account, you have to connect it to a bank account which I recommend and what I did is I went and opened a separate bank account because I don't need anyone else connected to my bank account. So I opened up a separate bank account at the same bank and I transferred funds into this separate account, hooked it up to my Coinbase and you just go in and you say, I want to buy, you know, a hat. And this is another thing to really point out to people is, you know, it's right now a Bitcoin is 7,200. You can go out eight decimals. So, you don't have to say, oh, I don't have $7,000. You can buy literally $10 of Bitcoin, you know, to get started if that's what you need to do to start, you know, getting into the, uh, the, the cryptocurrency world. So once you do that, you hook it up, you say buy, they tell you the price, there's a little bit of fee. Now it takes, I think, one day, they, they pull the money out of your bank account and it goes to, and then you have in your, uh, Coinbase account, you have, well, let's say you buy a tenth of a Bitcoin, you have it there and you have it in your account. Now you can do whatever you want with it. You can move it off of Coinbase, which a lot of people recommend and keep it at either a computer wallet or a paper wallet. Uh, that's a whole nother issue about how you should. And that's probably outside of my 
expertise is to figure out where you should and how you should keep uh, your Bitcoin, but it's definitely something that can be Googled pretty easily. Okay, Jeff, a couple uh, questions. Yeah. I want to do a couple questions yeah. before yeah. we let you go. Uh, Rob Hood, does he suggest not to bother with Ethereum or Litecoin? And uh, Frankie23 is curious about Ethereum as well. So I had a lot of, not, I, I had a fair amount of Ethereum. I sold everything. I'm only in Bitcoin right now. So not that I'm saying that uh, Litecoin or, or Ethereum aren't as good. I just know that this is where you want, this is where all the action is. Everybody talks about Bitcoin. This is what's being used for, again, in Japan. This is what people in the, the, the demand of Venezuela is really there. Ethereum last December, probably about a year ago, was trading at eight dollars. It's at three hundred. It's had a great move. Bitcoin is now like doubled, and Ethereum has just sat there. So, and I think there's a lot of overhang on Ethereum because I think I talked about this last time. All these token offerings, as initial coin offerings, most of them are done in Ethereum, where you have to let's say I want to raise you know, hundred million dollars in my coin offering. You have to do that in Ethereum. So now you have all these ICO holders or companies that have Ethereum and need cash. So they keep selling their Ethereum. So there's a huge overhang of Ethereum on the supply side. Uh, and it's just not moving. Litecoin, it, that's a great trading one because it definitely moves, but I'm just, I'm just in, I'm just in on the Bitcoin. I just want to be where the action is and what everybody's talking about. I know there's a, there's an attraction to buy Litecoin because it's only at what $60. So you're like, well, but I'd rather buy uh, a hundredth of a Bitcoin than one Litecoin. But that's me personally, not recommendation. Right. But- uh, this is, uh, I, I know you're making, uh, giving us great information. Jimmy A wants to know how could something <laughs> so volatile be a unit of exchange? It is, and yeah, yes, it, it is, and it's it's just as volatile as uh, other currencies are at some points, and uh, yeah, it's not an ideal <laughs> uh, medium of exchange because you know at one point whatever the item you're trying to buy could be really expensive or really cheap. So no, it's not ideal, and that's one of the that's one of the cons about using Bitcoin. You playing any as a, stocks off this? As a AMD, Nvidia, Nvidia, or Overstock? No, 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 nope. no, not personally, not personally. But I know, you know, obviously those stocks have had their move because of because of it. Okay, Jeff, I got a big compliment for you before I let you go. Oh, from not from me, uh, oh. from your yes in the chat, Jeff. Your book changed my life. Thanks. That's what he said. And that book, is, right. that book is failed traders. The 20 common mistakes committed by over 1000 losing traders. It's a Kindle edition on Amazon. I wrote the forward and uh, Dennis and I each put a little bit of a chapter in there. So it's a great book. So author, Bitcoin expert, and probably the uh, third best trainer at his gym, Jeff Goldman. Thanks for coming on. And we are going to get you back on again soon. Yeah. Thank you for the compliment. If you could put a nice review on Amazon, it would be great. Okay. <laughs> that was my plug. <laughs> Thanks. All right. Bye. All right. Uh, 836. Now we're going to take a quick break and grab uh, our second guest of the day, Lloyd Perlmutter. He's a retail, former retail executive and a retail advisor. And we'll be right back with Lloyd.
And welcome back, everyone, to Benzinga's Pre Market Prep. We're on with Lloyd Perlmutter. He is a uh, retail industry executive and advisor. Lloyd spent uh, eight years as the president of Gab Canada. We're talking to Lloyd uh, from some airport somewhere. So, Lloyd, thank you so much for joining us this morning. My pleasure, Ron. How are you doing this morning? Uh, doing great, doing great. So I want to ask you about sort of the changing uh, retail landscape. We had Macy's and Kohl's report this morning. I was reading last week that uh, J.C. Penney had eliminated uh, its chief merchandise or merchant uh, officer, which essentially is the person who decides uh, what what clothes the, the store carries. And I want to ask you about that. Uh, what was your sort of reaction to, to that? And was that was it a surprise to you? Uh, you know, it, it depends on, look, retailers today need to be as close to the consumer as possible. And so to eliminate a sort of a layer from that is not necessarily surprising. I think that there's um, a lot of redundancy sometimes in some of these organizations. And I think that the merchants for each of the departments or each of the um, uh whether it's men's, women's, or kids, or whether it's a particular category, they, they, they're making the decisions anyway. So you don't necessarily need uh, an extra body looking over their shoulders. So it's not necessarily a surprise at this point in time that they're getting rid of some redundancies and some layers in the organization. So, what do stores uh, like Kohl's and Macy's and J.C. Penney and and uh, and even even Target and and T.J. Maxx and 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 all the all the traditional retailers? Uh, what do they have to do to uh, make their stores more appealing? You know, I think you know, first of all, um, some some of the companies you mentioned are very fortunate because they're large enough and they have enough liquidity and they have enough cash to be able to uh, afford uh, overhauls in their technology. And that's really the key to the game right now is to make sure that everything's seamless between the online world, the digital world, and, and the physical world in terms of bricks and mortar. So I think that that's, first of all, that's number one. Uh, the companies that are struggling and, and that are in the sort of the mid-range and don't have the cash to do that um, and they have legacy systems are, are falling behind. I think secondly, um, you're, you're seeing a lot of, uh, again, a, a march towards private label and exclusive product coming back into focus, um, and even Amazon is doing some of that uh, in terms of their, uh, especially in their new apparel lines, and they're coming up with their own branded products in all kinds of categories. Uh, I think thirdly, uh, you're seeing a pullback of some of the brands for instance, Ralph Lauren is cutting back 25% of their doors that they're selling to, and you saw that an increase in gross profit in their latest uh, in the latest earnings report. So, um, I think that that's part and parcel of what's happening out there. The customers demanding uniqueness. Uh, if they're going to go into stores, they're going to want to have that experience, and they're going to want the unique products. And last but not least. You know, mobile is becoming a much more important ingredient to things. And the next, the next phase of that, the next trend of that is automated commerce, which is you know that whole notion of that that store that Amazon is putting together that you that you pick up merchandise and you walk out of the store without necessarily quote unquote paying for it. And there's a there's a, it scans you and, and scans all the items as you walk out and and it's automated, automatically charges you on your credit card or whatever um, means of payment that you gave them before. Um, those are the kinds of the, your vending machines, um, subscriptions, those are the kinds of things that are, uh, that are coming down the pike. So those, the retailers are trying to stay ahead of the game and try to stay ahead of the consumer from that standpoint. But I will tell you, Ron, that bricks and mortar is not going to go away. So even King Amazon um, understands this. So they bought Whole Foods. They're opening their own stores. They've now got shop and shops and Kohl's um, for some of their products. So I, I, it's just a reset of, of the situation in terms of marrying the online world with, with the physical world. Uh, speaking of brands, Lloyd, have you been following uh, what's happening with Under Armour? And do you have any opinions on how what they have to do to sort of break the ship? I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Have you been following Under Armour? And do you have thoughts yes, uh, I have. On, on what they have to do to sort of right the ship a little bit? You know, I, I think that um, it's a crowded marketplace. I think that um, I think their foray into the more casual 
sort of everyday apparel was probably a bit of a mistake. Um, and, and I think they're playing in the big, with the big boys. You know, they're playing with Adidas and they're playing against Nike. So uh, I think they're going to have some missteps along the way. They have stated very firmly that they're committed to their direct-to-consumer model, uh, whether it's stores or online or whatever the case may be. Um, and so I, I think they just got to stick, stay the course. I think they're going to be bumps in the road because they are the smallest of the big three. So, um, but you know, I think that they have to continue to innovate with their products and they have to continue to be relevant to the consumer. And I think sometimes you, you lose that a little bit when you grow so fast and so, you know, and so profitably that sometimes you get off the, off the track, but I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that they'll find their niche again and that they'll be a, a good player. I don't think that they're necessarily going to become the size of a Nike or an Adidas, um, but I think that they can find their own way and find their own niche like they have so far. All right, last one, Lloyd, and I'll let you go. Uh, who, uh, in your opinion, aside from Amazon, who is best in breed right now in retail? You know, that's a um, that's the uh, $64,000 question, right? <laughs> you know, I, I, I really think that there's, there's a couple out there that um, I, I would watch for Walmart, okay? Because Walmart's making an interesting for it. They made a huge investment in Jet.com. So they're going to come after Amazon with their, you know, they've got thousands and thousands of, of, of outlets, if you will, or distribution points uh, with their stores, which Amazon does not have. So I would really watch Walmart in terms of how they're going to integrate and marry up uh, the Jet.com purchase and the subsequent purchases they've made of online brands with their physical retail stores. And so, yes, Amazon is going and building all these huge, big warehouses and distribution centers. Walmart already has them in far, far corners of the country. And so they have a distribution advantage. Um, they just have never been able to uh, match the expertise online that Amazon has. But I think with the purchase of Jet.com, I think that's a real bonus. And I think it's somebody to watch. All right, Lloyd Perlmutter has been on the line. He was courteous enough to talk to us from the airport. He's about to board a plane, so Lloyd, thank you so much for the time, and uh, have a good flight. My, my pleasure. Have a great day. You too, Lloyd. All right, Eight, uh, 8.45, and uh, what, what's new, guys? I think we, we had some questions in the chat about, about Roku. There was a couple more stocks that we meant to discuss and, and hadn't gotten around to it, so where should we go? I don't know where, Ron, where do you want to go? <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't there a movie where there was like a character named Ron? Uh, was it Dodgeball or something like that? There's been a lot of movies with characters okay. named Ron. I just, Are you thinking of Captain Ron? Remember from the 80s? Oh, man, I'm not sure. All right, real quick. Uh, <laughs> S&P Futures. I told you guys about Monday. Ron Burgundy. <laughs> <laughs> there, that was it. Ron Burgundy. <laughs> Jimmy A's got your back. Ron Burgundy. <laughs> well, 50% of the time, it works every time. Jimmy A., you may need to get your head examined today <laughs> if you're thinking along my lines. Give that guy a free uh, subscription to Benzinga Pro. Uh, I, to the markets here, this is a market show, and the S&Ps, I had talked about 75.50, which was Monday's glow back slow. We went down to 75.50, and now we're three points above that. Uh, 45 minutes into the start of the regular session. So there's your support here on this uh, this bloody uh, Thursday morning here in the markets. All right, let's get to the stock. Yeah, are they gonna, is this going to go down in history? You know, it's one of those black Thursdays when the market fell 1%. You know what? With that one day <laughs> when I wanted to go to the quadruple lunch dinner and I was going to give you 20 to 1, I would have won that. It was Pandora, and it never, it didn't go under. Pandora five. never got to five, eh? It got like five hundred one. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's four eighty five now. I should have put a four day. I, I can't go those short, you know, ex expirations on those bets with you there. <laughs> no, four eighty five now, so it did go under five I bucks. The Pandora out. story. I'm still eternally bearish. Okay, Pandora. What do we staying away from Pandora? What do we want to do? We want to do. Oh, there's so many. We go to Fox. Oh, we could go to Dish. Where do you want to go? Where's Where's Ron? Where's Ron Burgundy want to go? I'm how about Ron? Ron wants to go to Roku. <clears throat> Roku! Talk to me about Roku, Spencer, because we were Ron. talking on the pre-pre-market show. Give us the numbers, and then tell me all about Roku. 
Okay, Roku Q3 adjusted EPS of a ten cent loss. They were expecting to lose a dollar and forty cents, so they beat that one. They're almost profitable, guys. Sales of one hundred and twenty-four point seven eight versus one hundred and ten point four seven million dollars. So uh, they beat that estimate as well. They are also um, coming in with guidance above the consensus estimate. So all around, a great report on Roku. And you want me to give you my like yes. long term. Yeah, what 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 is Roku? Because I don't use Roku. I've heard of Roku as a stock, but I really don't understand what it does at all. Okay, Roku is a lot like Apple TV. It is a box that connects to your TV, and you hook it up with your internet, and it, it basically allows you to watch channels, for lack of a better word. Those channels are Netflix, and they're Hulu, and they're Amazon, so it's all uh, cord-cutting channels, so anything that you don't need cable for. How uh, is it better than Apple TV? Because right. obviously, so, you know, this thing's up 30% today. It's a, it's, it's a hot it's, stock of the week. It's, it's, it a, it's a great point, because my general rule is don't mess with companies that compete with Apple, Facebook. That's my or, rule overall in life. Right. Yes, I, I, hey, it's a good rule, but there are exceptions to every rule, and I believe this could be an exception. Uh, for one, Roku was uh, first to market uh, in, in this particular space. They, uh, they beat Apple TV by, by several years. Also, it really comes down to uh, content on the platform, right? So, for example, they all have Netflix. All these Roku and Apple TV and, and Amazon, they all, have, they all have things like Netflix. They all have certain you know, core channels, but they don't all have the same – the same things. There are some things you can get on Roku that you can't get on Apple TV and vice versa. So it comes down to what you can get on each platform. So they're they're different. That's one thing I would say. Uh, and second thing I would say is I definitely think this is a case where there's room for more than one uh, uh, sp- uh, company or product in this market. There's uh, I think Nielsen estimated uh, last year, what was the number? 118 million homes with a TV uh, in the US. So let's say every home has two TVs. So that's like 240 million TVs and you only, you only get one box per TV. So uh, an Apple TV or a Roku only hooks up to, uh, to one TV. So 240 million. Did we lose Spencer? What? We, oh. it, we, you had, we had the Skype gremlin there for a second. You said 240 oh, okay. million, and then you cut out okay. for a second. 240 million TVs in this country. It's an estimation from Nielsen. Uh, so I think there's room for more than one uh, sp- company in this space. Uh, Here, you know. Here's a question, and this is coming from the chat as well, and this is exactly what I was going to ask you. And uh, Rob Hood and a couple of people asking basically the same. Rob Hood say, it's built in the TV screens now, though, aren't they? And any and is yeah. saying, yeah. can any device do the same thing? I'm going to say I actually have a smart TV. Look at me with the technology. And I can hook up to my Netflix and everything right through my TV. Why the hell do I need a Roku? Yeah, yes, that's a good point. Uh, Roku is actually <laughs> – no, no, I'm glad you brought that up. Roku is actually uh, b- uh, building uh, themselves into uh, into hardware, into TVs. So, you so can they're get, going to the TVs yeah, now. So Maybe so, I have a Roku. Maybe so, I don't so even know it. They're going that way too. Um, but I, I, I think I think this is a case where just just because Apple has a product that's like it does not mean you know you can't also have have a Roku uh, or or an Amazon uh, Fire Stick or or whatever it is or a, a, a Sling Box or whatever it is that you use. Um, I think this is just uh, it can be more than one. But yet yeah, they are similar products, and that's all I'll say. And then uh, long term thesis. Uh, I'm pretty bullish, but we're going to wait and see. Obviously, they had a great quarter, which helps a lot after your IPO. This has been a, a pretty bad year for uh, for big IPOs, so that's a positive. Uh, Joel, what's happening? What about what about um, YouTube TV for thirty five bucks? So that's not that's not hardware, right? Okay, so okay, that okay, okay, right. So Roku is hardware that you can it, I got watch. You. I got you. Spencer was a good pitch. It was a good educational uh, segment there. But as they do on Fast Money, I'm not in on this one. <laughs> and, uh, Dennis- uh, it's competing with Apple. You you lost me at, at competing with Apple. <laughs> Dennis- okay. So, but you know what? You'd be up 30% today, Spencer. So look who, you know, if you were buying that stock yesterday, you'd be rocking and rolling. Uh, I'm I'm out on this just because I don't like anything that competes with Apple. So um, I don't think I'm going to be putting this in my invest portfolio anytime soon. But you can trade anything, Joel. And Joel, I find I some will. levels. I will. And I got, I got a good level for you guys here. We did hit 25.54. Now, your high on October 10th was 25.60, right? And so there you go. There's your highs. There's your sell zone. If you're long, you want to see it. Get up through that pre-market high. Barrel through 2580. Get above 26. Go 26 and a half bid. If not, 
I think this thing is going to leak. And um, I think I gave a similar analogy, and I hope I'm not going to be dead wrong on this. What was the stock that was trading near 120 yesterday on a great report? Oh, I'm going to go uh, back to my sheets yesterday. Well, it. Take, it was take two. TTWO. Yeah. We're close. Yeah. You see, it had that 120.62 high yeah. early in the pre-market yeah. session. And then what was the regular session high? 120.62 right on the kisser. Yeah. See how it, uh, well, it actually pre-market high was right there. Pre-market high was just under that. It took it out by uh, two pennies and then settled near 117. So, all right, what else? Um, There's just so many to talk about here. Let's go over to, uh, I can't, this is a long handle there. I can't feel my FB. <laughs> I can't feel my Facebook. So, OSTK is what uh, that user is talking about in the chat here. And Overstock is trading up 15% of the pre-market. See, we're finding it. Stocks that are strong in this week tape. Anyways, Overstock, obviously reported earnings here. Spencer, details on Overstock. The recent loss versus a 12-cent loss in the same quarter as last year. Sales of $424 million versus a $432 million estimate. So a slight miss there, but a slight beat uh, or a slight uh, increase year over year on the EPS. That stock is trading right near, well, I don't know where it's got to in the pre-market. I can tell you the all-time high there, 48.25, which was hit just November 1st, so very recently. The stock's been an absolute monster. It's a stock we don't cover a lot on the show. I think we've mentioned it once or twice, but I mean, really, since the summer, stock had been meandering for a long time in the 15 area and just blasted off into orbit since the summer, up to 45. It's obviously tripled in price here. Thoughts, Joel, technically speaking, OSTK. Uh, doesn't this have something Bitcoin going related or... I think there was a head. I, what? They are a way. They are a way to trade uh, 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 or get exposure because they have some blockchain stuff. Uh, <laughs> no, anything with Bitcoin is hot. Okay. Bitcoin's so hot right now. All right, uh, your pre-market high is right at forty-seven. Even you've only backed off to forty-six forty. Actually, I stand corrected. That high was forty-seven oh five. Now, that is making a new all-time high. Uh, the former, nope, got a ways to go, 48 and a quarter. So if you're looking for more upside, you maybe got another buck, buck and a quarter, all-time high, 48 and a quarter, just a longer-term number to keep an eye on, 46.05 is your all-time closing high. So caught a cold. The one time it got up to 48 and a quarter, it closes at 46.15. Next day, it got up to 48 even, closed at 43.70. So 46.15, the all-time closing high in overstock.com. All right. User in the chat there, Chef, wants to know about the imbalances, which we have not mentioned yet here today. So pre-market imbalances are mixed, actually, despite you know being way down here. I'm actually finding a few buy imbalances in there, too. Alibaba, 68000 to buy. I'm assuming that's going to flip to sell eventually here as more institutions will probably come in and lick their chops at anybody that's going to be buying a stock today. Um, also with a buy imbalance is Square, but Square has come back from the lows. And Square has bounced back, SQ, but it's 46000 to buy here right now. So it's still a pesky buy imbalance in there trying to hold up the stock. But I'm not sure it's going to be able to on a day like this. Uh, if I'm going to the sell, or actually one more, big buy imbalance. Look at this one. Snap, SNAP has 376,000 shares to buy in Snap. That's a huge buy imbalance for Snap. Um, it's trading down here 1.8% too. So one of two things are going to happen. That buy imbalance is going to flip to sell. The stock's going to start going higher. Because if this was 930 right now, we see 376,000 to buy. That means the stock would actually open higher. So probably more institutional selling is going to come in. It's already traded 718,000 shares. So I would bet on the latter that this probably actually uh, imbalance just probably comes and down and goes to negative. Um, but Snap, let's talk about this one because this thing got annihilated yesterday. Um, it did bounce back a little bit when we had that in investment from 50 cent. Oh, oh, 10 cent. I took Kramer's joke there. Um, what are your thoughts here on Snap, SNAP? We're trading down here again. Joel, are you getting uh, down dirty in the snap? I know. I'm hoping that it at least trades 1134 someday. Or no, 1177 because uh, then you wouldn't have not have. Oh, that was the low from yesterday. What's the old time low, Dennis? You know, you sold it. 1128. 11.27. That's why I hope it trades. 11.28. Oh, yeah, we have to see 11.27 so I can get me out of there. Right. So I can stop saying that I sold the all time low and snap. Right. Uh, I've had to say that for three months. All right. I. Let's see here. The buy balance is not really giving it a boost yet, right? 
from no, you know why? Because everybody's skeptical. When you see a market down this much, and you see something with a buy and balance, you think automatically, oh, it takes one institution to say sell them. And you know, if some institution comes in and says sell five hundred thousand. All of a sudden, it's going to flip to one hundred twenty-four thousand to sell. That's what everybody's anticipating is going to happen. That's actually what I'm anticipating is going to happen. If I didn't anticipate that was going to happen, I would be buying it right now in the pre-market. I'm not doing that because we're down so big. It's got you know, it's kind of in you know, I've been kicked around here yesterday. Not surprising it's followed through. I you know, I personally think it's probably going to go to a negative imbalance before the open. Still, tw- 33 minutes for institutions to come in, and a lot of those don't show their hand until the last minute or two. All right, uh, twelve held up yesterday, right? Just above twelve was the low, uh, twelve ten. So let's see if it can hang in there for a couple of days. Twelve even to twelve ten, uh, trading down. Your pr- pr- closing price was twelve ninety one. So you want to see it at least get into the thirteen handle when people are going to be, you know, a little bit more bullish after the report. We could just do some chopping around here for 12 and 13 for a couple days. But uh, let's see if we can put a double bottom in. Someone's bullish here. Tencent has made some pretty good investments. So we'll keep an eye on this one. Yesterday's low, 12.10. Jump over here. Uh, we just got one minute left here. And uh, we didn't give any ratings changes. Snap was downgraded by Morgan Stanley here today. So that's another reason why it's trading down. Stock we haven't talked about for a lot, uh, a long time on the show is Match, MTCH, and that actually made a new high yesterday, uh, then pulled back off of those highs. It's getting downgraded this morning at Oppenheimer, so looking to fill that gap. This is Tinder, right, Spencer? Match? Oh, this, match? Is match, this is Match.com and Tinder. Uh, they own both, though. So, okay, so the hookup websites here, MTCH. It's been hot. I mean, new all-time highs here, Joel. I mean, you know, you look out the weeklies or even look out to the monthlies. This was, you know, in 2016 down to 8 bucks. Now it's $29.59 or 2905 here in the pre-market. Thoughts on MTCH? Yeah, I would. It, 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 what did it get? It got an upgrade? Or down, a downgrade. A downgrade. I mean, I would get maybe get interested here if it could fill the gap. You had a double top at twenty eight dollars, right? Big so, level, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I'll, I'm not going to try and pick a bottom in between the low from yesterday with the downgrade. What I'd like to do, see it pull back to the twenty eight dollar area, find support and hold there. Uh, coming back um, on the upside, when you see a downgrade in something that you know has had as good a run as it did yesterday, so the new old time closing high yesterday. Twenty nine fifty nine. That would be the mark that I'm sure it's, is it offered below there right now, Dennis. Where was someone offering it down already? Uh, just bring it back up. I just changed it. MTCH. It's offered. Well, the it's really widespread. It's twenty nine twenty nine to thirty twenty four. Very wide, but it's downgraded, so you got to assume it's going to open down. Yeah, keep an eye on that old time closing. All right, it is nine o'clock. Let's go to our own anchor man, Ron Burgundy, to uh, wrap, <laughs> <laughs> to wrap up the show and preview the final show of the week. <laughs> All right. Uh, on on tomorrow's show, we're joined by uh, one of our favorite guests, the Reverend Emmanuel Lemelson. He's got a couple of uh, highly convicted shorts. I know last time he was on our show, he discussed his short in uh, Dominoes. He's also short uh, Ligand, and there's one or two more. I believe he's got some uh, some good commentary on uh, Geospace. That was the one that he was. Got, was he long or short Geospace? He's Joel? bullish Geospace. Okay, bullish Geospace. Uh, short out of Ligand. He threw a nickel on that one. Okay, out of Ligand and uh, still short Dominoes. So we'll talk all that with the Reverend when he's on tomorrow's uh, show. But that's it for us today. If you want to catch our podcast, you can do so on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Stitcher by searching for Benzinga or Premier Rocket, or go to youtube.com slash Benzinga TV to catch our show there. If you listen to the show on YouTube or any of our podcasts, you can watch our show every day at premarket.benzinga.com. And that is for us today. Hope everyone has had a good morning. Hope you have a good rest of your day. And uh, stay classy, everyone. <laughs>